Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for the needlework artist. And our artist this week is Amanda Cobbett of Embroidered Nature. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Gary. Thanks for joining us here. And this show is sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery. And here is a word from Kim. This edition of Fiber Talk is proudly sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery. Sassy Jack's is a vibrant young needle workshop located on the picturesque Main Street of Weaverville, North Carolina. We hope you find a way to come visit us soon. If you can't make it to us, then visit us on Facebook or Instagram. We love it when you stop by and say hi, whether it's in person or online. Many heartfelt thanks to everyone who stitched our free download, Aussie Friends. We are overwhelmed by how many of you have taken the time to stitch and post this sweet little benefit for fire recovery in Australia. Please feel free to share this design with anyone you like, including guilds and stitch groups. We'll be tallying up all the posted and emailed finishes through February 29th to determine our contribution to two Australian charities working on fire recovery. Every stitch counts, and we so appreciate all of your positive energy, thoughts, and prayers going to everyone and every animal impacted by these horrific wildfires. Thank you for stitching with us to support our Aussie friends. If you haven't signed up for our winter online class module, Learning Stitches, please join us as we're just getting rolling. You can find the info on our homepage at sassyjackstitchery.com. We'd love to have you join us on this first of many fun and affordable online workshops. We truly appreciate you, and we really appreciate all the good things we hear and learn from Fiber Talk. We are super proud to be a sponsor of this wonderful resource of stitching goodness. Thank you, Fiber Talk, for giving us some stabby pokey talk twice a week. Kim and team at Sassy Jack Stitchery. Thanks, Kim, and please support all of our sponsors. They're who make this thing possible. And Amanda, now this is going to be a different Fiber Talk podcast because it's not tr- traditional needle thread and ground cloth. Amanda does amazing things with a sewing machine and thread and paper mache making mushrooms and lichens and all kinds of uh, nature-based art. And I have to say, Amanda, I am really excited. I've, I've been wanting to get to you for some time now because I used to do a lot of photography. I wish I did more of it now. But my favorite kind of photography is nature, macro, and getting close. So, like, I take a picture of a flower. I don't take a picture of a flower. I take a picture of part of the flower. And when I saw your work, it was like, oh, you're, you're singing my song. Uh, that up close, little, the, the little tiny things in nature that you find, oh, fascinating stuff. What, uh, what, what brings you to do that? What, what is it that, I mean, you, you, you get right down in there close. It's so much fun to watch uh, what you get out of that. Where do I start? I, um, I've always been interested in nature, even, you know, as a small child. Uh, I used to collect all sorts of things. I, I think I probably lived in my own little fantasy world um, because I didn't have any sisters to play with. I've just got two brothers. And I, I think I had to make my own fun. So <laughs> I would spend a lot of time outside. I think uh, our, my parents used to probably encourage us to go outside and, and play. And um, I, we lived under this lovely big old oak tree and I used to collect acorns every autumn and make little pixie cups. And um, I was I was interested in everything that was that was the, a miniature, a, you know, my doll's house, everything that I could that I could, you know, look at the detail of. That's what I was really interested in. And I suppose because that that's always been an interest, it, it, it was in, with my work, it was there was a natural progression into studying detail. Yeah, see, I relate I relate so closely to that because that's what I do. Just everything I always want to get in to the minute details and see the texture and uh, you know the subtleties rather than the bigger picture. And to me, that's where yeah, the real I, fun is at. I think a lot of people forget about that because there's very so busy looking at the bigger picture that they um, sometimes neglect the detail. Um, But that's always been the thing that's interested me. And to be able to now use it uh, with my work is an absolute pleasure. 
Yeah, you win on that account, no doubt about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now, did you did, did in your early years uh, an artist, uh, biologist, science? What uh, what orientation did you start from? No, I was. I've always been encouraged to uh, to to do art and to be creative. Um, both my grandparents or gra my my grandmothers, should I say, um, were both uh, needle workers, and my mother is very good on the sewing machine. Um, but they they taught me the things that you that you teach a kid in the seventies. You know, I, it was a traditional childhood where every child probably sewed or every girl sewed. I know that's not um, the case these days, but. Um, I, I think in the as a, as a typical 70s child, that was that was something that I enjoyed watching my my grandmothers and my mother do. Um, and I, I, I never realized textiles featured quite so much in my life and, until they did, if that makes sense. So learning to, learning to sew from them and um, and then going to college I always actually thought I was going to be a photographer I had I had no even uh comprehension or conception of of um what I, what somebody who worked in textiles did I don't think I even knew that there was such a job I, I mean <laughs> I knew people made clothes uh -huh. but I didn't realize that I could make a job out of it I was um at, at uh, art college doing a foundation because in the UK, you, you 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 go through your school education, and then you do a foundation year if you want to go into art college. And uh, that foundation year, you you try a bit of everything. So so I tried photography, I tried sculpture, I tried um, some textiles, some woodwork, some some metalwork, all, all, a number of different things. Um, but it was the I always came back to the fabric as much as I enjoyed doing all the, those other things. And in fact, during my A-levels, I have an A-level in, in sculpture, which I'm very proud of. Um, and, I, and I think I always loved making things in, in three dimension. And, and textiles was another way of being able to do that. Um, I suppose you might assume that if you're if you're doing something with textiles or fiber art that that it that it might be two dimensional but for me it's always been a three dimension it's always been about the three dimension and it's been a combination of adding texture and uh, form um, but actually when I started my career I I didn't I didn't start out as as doing what I do now and in fact I was um, I graduated as a, a printed textile designer and of course that's very flat um and yes. my world <laughs> rule, just yes. remained flat <laughs> yes it remained flat for about i don't know 10 12 years um until i got to saturation point and it it, it was really then that i thought okay, i can i need to to as much as i love designing and i still use that design aspect when i'm creating a piece of work um i I just ha I just needed to be able to make something. And that's always been the physical side of actually being able to make something is really important. Yeah, well, that that textile uh, designing, printed textile designing, I mean, that's its own art form. There's uh, at some point there's a challenge to that. But I can see after a while you go, OK, how many patterns can I put together? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, after doing that for several years and, and in fact, I um was always there was a team of us uh, uh, that used to work freelance for a company but I was always the floral designer and um, I, I must have designed and uh, hundreds and hundreds of florals in hundreds <laughs> of different ways and, um, I, and actually that makes me quite picky about wearing clothing now because I know how well or how how badly a floral has been designed it's a so curse <laughs> it really is it is a curse actually um and and in, and in fact for a while i hated i hated florals that just shows you how much um i did of it and, and got so so completely saturated by it that i just thought okay i just don't i don't need to do this anymore i've enjoyed it at the time but i just don't need to do it anymore we'll never see amanda in a flowered blouse ever <laughs> no <laughs> very rarely i do love print um 
but I'm I'm very picky about the prints that I choose to wear um, because I, I I know whether they've been well designed or not. Yeah. And and also color color plays a massive part in that as well. Um, you know, but everybody knows what they like and what they don't like, I suppose. But um, yeah, I can definitely I can definitely tell in the shops a a bad <laughs> design, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know that feeling because I'm a magazine editor and uh, the printed word reading novels or anything, it's the same curse. It, oh, I, yeah. I find everything. Why didn't you write the sentence this way? Or yeah. how could you miss this typo? And yeah, it just. Uh... Yeah, I mean, there are there's there's a million different ways to, to do something, I suppose. Um, but uh, each to their own, I guess. Some people will never notice those things. But if you're if you're looking at it, day in day out unfortunately you do start to notice those things yeah yeah it won't leave you alone i guarantee you yep mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so you all right so you had sewing from your grandmother and mother and yeah. art and textiles and ended up doing flowers so that all really just kind of came together with to to make what you do now yeah i kind of feel that everything that that's happened in the past has led me to where i am now um when I was studying for my degree, I was really fortunate that uh, my my course, one of the course leaders was um, a floral, textile floral designer as well. Mm -hmm. And she really encouraged me to, to sort of perfect the art, I suppose. And uh, she introduced me to uh, uh, some beautiful botanical illustrations that that we went to look at at the Natural History Museum in London and I was allowed a library pass so I could go and look whenever I wanted and they were be they are beautiful colour plate illustrations um, the first ones that she showed us or that, that we went to see were from uh, Cook's first voyage mm. so they're utterly beautiful um, and then I, I was I also had um, the library pass allowed me access to Kew Botanical Garden. Um, so I was sort of got the backstage pass to ah. to Kew and um, could go and look at any number of things there. So it sort of uh, sparked my interest in in the botanical more more than ever, I suppose. When you're when you're textile designing, print designing. Uh, it, you, you can't always, you know, use that information, that reference material, because firstly, there's no time. And secondly, it's just not relevant for, for, for what I'm doing. But at the moment, the things that I can that I do now, I can go back to all those resources. And they're only too pleased to have someone who's who's got an interest um, to, to go and, um, you know, use them use yeah. use their library and their resources because mm -hmm. that's really what it's there for it's it's research right so i can see the wires connecting now you get uh, botanical garden and uh, mm -hmm. beautiful plates and yeah i can see your mind starting to put that together and say yeah. wait a minute i can create something out of this yeah it was it's almost like how how can you make something that's um that you can find look real um, because because really that's what um, botanical artists were doing and there was no there was no use of photography so they had to they had to record the information so I suppose in a way this is that's what I'm doing I'm trying to record the information that I that I'm seeing when I'm on my dog walk in the woods or if I'm you know, going to do some research somewhere, particularly for a certain type of lichen or or fungi. So, um, yeah, this is my way of of um, recording information. So, how do we get started on it? What What's the first piece? What's the mental process that gets you started on making the kinds of things you do today? I'm sure the early ones were fascinating little efforts. <laughs> well, it took the, the the early ones took quite a long time. I think, oh, I'm really, you know, I've, it was taking me a month to make one one case full of of mushrooms, and I was quite pleased with myself. Whereas today, you know, if it was, I'd never, I'd, I'd never be successful <laughs> if it was taking me that long. Um, but the yeah, so the 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 start of the process really is a walk to take a walk to sort of clear my mind to to see what I can find and and having a 
having a dog uh, makes you do that because you have no choice. You have to walk. Yes. And um, so, so fr- Frank, my dog, and I go out on a dog walk and uh, go out on a walk rather. And um, he bumbles along, and I either I I either walk to solve a problem or walk to look for stuff Mm -hmm. so um when i'm walking to solve a problem i walk quite quickly and um i'm just enjoying being in the forest being immersed in 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 the wood uh that's that's directly opposite my house um if i'm walking to look then obviously it's a much slower walk um, and it's usually in the afternoon I'm looking uh, for something interesting. And it can be anything. Anything can spark it. Um, it could be, you know, based on colour, on texture um, or something that I haven't seen before. Um, there's there's various lichens that, that are popping up all the time that um, and I don't. I, I confess I don't know all the scientific names for all of them. I have to bring them home and look them up and try and work out if that's what I'm looking at and you know what what I what I've got before me is is right. what I can find in my reference. Yeah. Um, and fun, but it's fungi, also an, fungi are not easy either. So I, I, I admire no, the fact that you not. were slapping uh, scientific names on those because they're not easy at all. <laughs> yeah. No, they're not. Um, but over the years, I I've sort of got to know what I can find and where and it's quite interesting year on year um, when you look in the same places as to what you see and the time of year you see it and what the crop is like because sometimes you might see one or two and another year there'll be hundreds and mm-hmm. then another year there won't be any so it, it's quite interesting to also record that information on on what's growing where and at what time of year and i i do that i record all the information on my phone so i would i take a photograph of what i see i then take a grid reference of where i found it and that obviously the photograph has the date and and um the time i think on it as well um so it's it's quite interesting to that you can you know modern technology allows you to be able to do that whereas um, you know, on Cook's first voyage, you're relying <laughs> totally on their ability to be able to make an accurate representation by drawing it right. and, and, and using the right colours and and trusting that the colours that they've got there, they're perhaps, you know, fairly primitive colour palette are right. the colours that you're seeing. Yeah. Whereas, you know, today... I could, I could maybe photograph um, a fungi one day and then the following day that might have degraded a little bit or, you know, the following year that the one, you know, one might one year it might be brighter than another year. It just it just depends. But but that's that in itself is quite interesting. So when I'm making my work, I'm trying to represent those facts as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's just it. And for most mushrooms, their life cycle is so short that yeah. you, you could catch it at any point and not know if that's its peak or not. No, I mean, you do, I suppose like, you do get to know, I do, I, now that I've done it for you know, <laughs> yeah, five, yeah. six years, you kind of get to know when you think, oh, and I'm walking every day. So I might pass that every day and I might even photograph that, that specimen maybe three, four, five times as it as it starts to degrade and actually sometimes it becomes a bit more interesting when it's when it's not perfect um because that's nature you want to you want you want to see the the imperfections as well yeah that well and that was something i wanted to explore with you because uh in in my photography oftentimes what's most interesting is not when whatever the subject is is at its peak it's before or after or maybe after it's long yeah. dead it, it makes yeah. it yeah, yeah interesting yeah there's a there's um a mushroom that i find in the woods called a shaggy ink cap um and i don't know if you have them in america but um we have they're quite we have quite a few here in in our wood and um as they emerge they're sort of like a, a shaggy white 
um, tube. They're quite they're quite long, quite long cone shaped um, mushrooms. And then when they as they start to spread out and get a bit a bit more shaggy, um, you know, the, the the tops of them change quite quite dramatically and then underneath they're quite dark you know it's a sort of black and white contrast Mm -hmm. um but uh, and they get quite big but over a number of uh, over a number of days and then suddenly you know you go the next day and they're completely gone you know no sign completely gone um but just but watching that watching that cycle is is really really fascinating yeah well to me that yeah that's Really, the interesting part is how they process through and and become so different from when they start. Yeah, that makes yeah. It, makes it fun. So yeah. when I'm when I'm making my work, quite often I might do I, I might show different stages. I might make three of of the same thing, but in different stages, just just so you could you can see that they don't. Because if you go out and think, oh, that's how they always look all the time, then you'd be mistaken right, because right. The, because they're changing the whole time. Right. So I quite like to be able to. And sometimes in my cases, I might have um, three three of the same specimens. So I might have three shaggy ink caps, say, but in various stages of of along along their life cycle, mm-hmm. just to show you how you know the progression. Yeah, when I was. Uh... A, a wise photographer taught me when you approach a scene to first photograph the scene so that at least you've recorded whatever the scene is, mm. but then just stand there and absorb it. And that's when the real photos show up. Does yeah. that happen to you when you walk up to an area? Yeah. yeah, it definitely does. I'm quite often seen just standing around. <laughs> I'm sure there are people that walk past me in the wood thinking oh god there she is or what the hell is she doing <laughs> yeah i quite off i am quite often just standing around i just like to absorb the moment you know especially um you know even like today the weather was really wild um and most people are hurrying along and, and want to get out of the rain but i just want to sometimes it is just good just to stand and and watch the trees see what's happening um you know, on a frosty day, just to just to look at the how the forest sparkles, and it's just little things like that that make that make life magical. Right. Um, I'm still living in my little fairy world, probably <laughs> that I was in when I was when I was a little girl. Yeah, but it's it's the, at those moments when you just stop and let it just let it soak into you that then then the the things to me at least they start to pop out. Oh, I've yeah. never seen I've never seen this over here, or I've never seen yeah. this in this way, yeah. and 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 that's when it really comes to life for me. Yeah, 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 definitely. And actually, when especially the the the, the funky that are, are are brightly coloured, because actually when you you can really look at the detail, and that, then when you stand back, you think how why is this is something bright red or purple that's just it's just there who's who's noticed who's actually noticed that you're mm-hmm. there um and yeah yeah when you zone back out and look at the bigger picture it's that sudden little pop of red in the corner of your eye yep. that that you that that almost shouldn't be well it should be there but it it's it's like a little jewel little my little jewels in the forest right right yeah so then when when you're on these walks then you actually collect specimens well i so most of the most most of the fungi i would i photograph because um firstly some of them are very poisonous and, yeah that was going to be um, my next question is what yeah, are you doing so about I don't, that <laughs> so i kind of i've kind of got to know and i'm really careful i always wash my hands when i come in if i have been touching anything um because it's okay to touch them it's just not okay then to put your hands in your mouth right. so um yeah so a lot of them i photograph um i rarely I rarely pick them unless it's something I really don't know. And I think, right, okay, I could, I could take that back and, and look it up, but I can usually work from, from photographs and I go out there a lot. So I'm, I'm looking and observing because that's, that's mainly 
what it's about making my work is about observation so and I obviously I can't stitch in the field or do anything and I and I don't take a sketchbook to draw because I suppose I feel I don't need to so um yeah just from my my daily observations and then I would have a photograph to remind me of of how that looked um yes but but in terms of the um the lichen and the bark and the mosses um I don't take mosses from the forest because you're not actually allowed to do that Mm. um but what I can do is take um fallen bits of um you know sort of debris on the forest from the forest floor so so if a piece of bark has fallen off a tree and it's laying on the ground then I would take it back and then I can work directly like that um and they obviously they do dry out but they don't degrade quite as quickly as um you know, a mushroom or, or fungi is going to. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wondered about that because, yeah, you could go through a forest and just take specimens all day long and, and upset the ecosystem to some degree. And you Oh, yeah, do no, that. no. Yeah. And in fact, um, I get slightly tetchy when I see, I never say <laughs> anything, but I, 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 I can feel myself going, oh, don't take them all when I see people foraging. Yeah, because there's there's a way to... There's there's a law, there's a foraging law, and um, I think some enthusiastic people don't know what the the foraging rules are. Right. And you shouldn't actually pick a um, a fungi up with its root attached. Um, you should actually cut them off. Yeah. But I think a lot of people don't do that. And I and in fact, you know, when I'm making them, I'm trying to show the roots as well. Mm-hmm. So I have to use. Um, uh reference i'm using reference books to look at roots and things because i feel that um you know obviously my photographs aren't going to show that um so i am having to use good reference books as well to 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 show how they would look if they were they were plucked out of the ground sometimes i do sometimes i take them out if i know there's lots of them there but i certainly wouldn't decimate a, a wood with with from one species because because you just can't do that yeah yeah exactly so this woods that is is across from your home uh is that does that give you pretty much all you need or do you find yourself getting in the car and going other places um well if i'm invited to other places to other to other woods then i definitely go um the the wood is big enough for me to keep me busy um for a very long time however Um, just recently I have been, I was invited up to Yorkshire because I'm doing a project with the, uh, North Yorkshire Moors National Park. And, um, I, have just finished doing some research up there because obviously the things that they have there are quite different to, to, to what I have in, in the South of England. That said, um, there are obviously things that that are that I can see there which I can also see here however they are you know here where it's it's slightly warmer I know it's only two three hundred miles away uh 200 200 miles away however it's it's cold and uncompromising in Yorkshire in the winter and, and so what's growing there is is much smaller and much brighter than perhaps I can see in my own wood Mm -hmm. so it's quite interesting to make that comparison and and there are things um in on the in on the moors and in sort of fen and and bog that that um especially the mosses that i certainly I, i i don't see them in my own wood i mean i'm here with beech and oak and and pine and fir so um and and that's that's quite different to to where I was doing my research a couple of weeks ago that have a lot of older um, and uh, older and elder actually, which, which I I don't see so much of here. So Mm -hmm. it's quite interesting. I mean, that's, you know, it's quite interesting to go and see what, what lichen grows on, on, on what, on on each different tree. And in fact, a couple of years ago, Sarah and I did a research trip um, in Scotland and, the lichen that grows there is phenomenal. It's beautiful. And we certainly don't have 
the, the specimens that we found down here. Um, and I don't know if you know, lichen is an indicator indication of how clean your air is. No, I did not know that. Educate me. Well, um, the more lichen on a tree um, is a good indicator of how clean your air is. So, as an example, if you were so to go to so a city more, or less... it's more is cleaner air then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you go you go up to Scotland, it, up to the Highlands. Um, and you know you've got beautifully clean air if you can find trees that are laden with with lichen. And it's the same. We I go to the Alps, the French Alps, every year um, to walk. The trees up, you know, in the, the alpine forests are beautiful because they are laden with these fantastic lichens and mosses that um, that just don't grow in the same way. And it's it's about altitude and as as well. Um, but it, but but what you see is is almost like supersized to to some of the things that we can see here, where the air quality perhaps isn't as good. Mm -hmm. See, that was when when I first saw your work. That was one of the things that popped into my head, is the amazing things, the, the subtle differences, um, you know, and extreme differences that you must see in doing this kind of work, because it it uh, just a hundred miles can make such a huge difference. Yeah, that's right. And, and 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 it's about getting your eye in as well, because you don't you wouldn't even think or, or, or I said, well, I, I think there was a lot of I, I took my friend to Yorkshire with me and she that was her first reaction was that she wouldn't even think to look mm -hmm. for something different. Whereas, you know, I, I suppose it's an interest of mine and I am looking all the time, but I'm but the but yeah, so the things you see in in one place certainly aren't the things that you're going to see elsewhere. Or if they are, they might be, like I say, different size um, or slightly different color be, because yeah. of the quality of the air. Yeah. All right. So let's take take your your typical mushroom. Take me through the process, the learning process of creating <laughs> the art. That well, must so have taken must of... have been quite a process, I think. <clears throat> Um, well, there was a lot of experimentation um, as to, you know, how the devil was I going to even <laughs> start making this? Or, and, and I think mushrooms and, and fungi have always held a fascination because because they're they are so completely unusual. And, you know, they're neither, um, <clears throat> you know, they're not an animal form, then then they're not a um a botanical thing that you know they are a species of their of their own and more related to animal than they are plant mm -hmm. um and, and then you know just completely fascinating so um sitting here in my in my little studio thinking how how will i make this how can i make something that obviously isn't real because how could it be because most people know that as soon as you've picked a mushroom that it will degrade fairly quickly. And some of them, you know, within some of the tiny ones that, that you, that you see in the forest within half an hour of you picking them, then they would have wilted. Mm -hmm. And um, I did do a little bit of experimentation in the early days of, Oh, let me, let me see what happens to that. If I, if I pick that, what will happen to it? And then being very disappointed within, you know, <laughs> half an hour of think, looking at it, thinking, oh, that's a little bit disappointing now because that's very <laughs> shriveled up. Um, but the idea that you could you could make something appear to be real but but not real, um, and try to trick the eye was to and, and also to to work out a way of using the materials that I had available to me. You know, my, my background's textiles. So that was my first thought. How could I, how could I make something in textiles that, that could be perceived as something that's serious and not, um, <clears throat> you know, that, that, that I could, people could look at and, and think, now, am I look, what am I looking at? Am I looking at something that's, that's real or made so um paper and thread are, are my two main materials and um 
paper is a paper is great for a number of reasons because it's so versatile and I use so so to make my my mushrooms for example I'm using a paper mache for to make the stem um, and that's great for support um, and it's and it's such a solid material once you've added some <clears throat> size to paper to stick it um, it then it then becomes like a a lighter version of wood again because you <clears throat> you've made it so solid and mm -hmm. then you can once so once it's solid and I use I make a solid tube for for the stems of of the mushrooms and then once they're completely dry I can then carve them with a knife mm -hmm. so and, and I learned to do that over time because you know I didn't really have any any carving skills however now I've sort of learnt that in order to get the shapes that I want, because they're not all straight up and down, um, <clears throat> I, I have to be able, you know, I had to work out a way of 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 being able to do that. So, so, so once the stem is completely dry, I'm then um, using a knife to carve it and then sanding it down, like with sandpaper and wet and dry paper, which is like a glass paper. Um, so then, all right, so that right helps finish. me understand. That's what I was trying to understand because if the stems have mm -hmm. a bulbous portion to them, you're yeah. delivering that. So that's how you're doing that is yeah. taking a straight tube yeah. and then and forming it. Yes, yeah. So I'm adding just little layers, layers each time, just adding layers and layers of paper and then drying it. And then when it's completely solid and they really are, I mean, they're, they're sort of invincible. If I was to drop one of my sculptures on the floor and nothing would happen to it, it's not going to get damaged mm -hmm. because they're, they're solid. They're solid little things. They, they don't, you know, the good thing about paper is that it's not going to crack yeah, and it's, right. it's not really going to dent it either. And actually it wouldn't really matter even if it did, but it, but it doesn't. Um, so the stem is the, the support really as it, as it is on a regular um, mushroom fungi. Um, and then I had to work out a way of then making uh, the, the caps, the mushroom caps. Um, <clears throat> and that's where my sewing, my, my machine embroidery uh, technique then came in. And, and, and I've said before uh, to other people that I'm obviously I'm not an embroiderer. I didn't train in embroidery. I knew nothing about embroidery before <laughs> I started doing this. And um, my uh, my mother-in-law's friend had a sewing machine that was that was practically gifted to me. And my mother-in-law is is an embroiderer, um, machine and hand embroiderer, and her her friend brenda is also do, also does both and they were they were very kind and they were very supportive to me or well, they still are um and showed me a few techniques um and at first i didn't even i wasn't even making any of this stuff i was thinking i was given the machine and i was thinking oh what am i going to do with this what am i going to do what am i going <laughs> to make am i going to how am i going to use this machine and then it was a, a, it was sort of then limitless because because I have no formal training. I sort of felt that there were no rules that I was suddenly going to be breaking. So I was just making up my own rules. And it's still like that. I'm still still kind of making up my own rules because that's the way it works for me. I, I'm just, you know, it's free motion embroidery. It's it's great fun. I can just clear my mind and just see what I can make. And and. And it, it never really goes wrong because there's nothing to go wrong with right. it. Um, <clears throat> but I have, in, in terms of, say, for instance, making mushroom caps or making the um, some of some of the lichen, which is very very intricate, um, I've had to sort of work out some little techniques um, of, of how to achieve that. And uh, what uh, it. During my life as a printed textile designer, I also did a little bit of designing of of, of homewares, which included tableware. Um, and I used to have to um, make a print design that fitted around, say, fitted around a, a breakfast bowl. So you're, you're given in the old days before it was computerized, you were given the shape 
of the um, of the bowl that of the the pattern that needed to fit around the bowl. So you weren't given a bowl; you were just given the shape. Mm -hmm. So so from that, the information that I had from that, I could work out. Okay, so I now know how to make a a bowl shape, which is similar to a mushroom cap. Uh -huh. um, or, a, or a cone shape if I was making something else, you know, some other homeware that required it to be in a cone shape. So, see, so kind of my my relating or translating 2D to 3D was sort of my brain sort of could work out mm -hmm. what pattern to what how to sew a pattern and and so machine embroider in the right direction in order to make the right shape. Um, and it's still trial and error. And I, I try lots of different things all the time, but I kind of know now how to construct something using thread. And it's and it's sewing thread onto a, a dissolvable fabric, which I use two different types. One is a very soft uh, and it looks like a bonded fabric. And another one looks more like a plastic fabric. Um they, they're both dissolvable in warm water and, uh, you know, they're safe to use. Yeah. Uh, I know that the, the plastic type one is like an algae based fabric. Oh, okay. um, I don't know if you've ever used them. No. When I saw that on the video on your website, uh, it, it looked like you were were uh, stitching on um, uh, cling wrap, saran wrap. Yeah, for, yeah, for food. yeah, yeah. That's what it looks like. Yeah, yeah, and it it's absolutely not that at all. It's so so that washes that completely washes away, um, and then it just leaves you with your your thread. But obviously, you know, um, as any embroiderer will tell you that if you're if you're doing this kind of embroidery that you have to lock over your stitches. Otherwise you're going to end up with just <laughs> one big mess. Right. Um, so, you, so you kind of, you kind of need to work it through a bit in your mind, how you're going to um, not make it all fall apart. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but that kind of happened quite quickly that, you know, I managed to manage to work it out. Yeah, that was, that was my, my thought as I was watching the process in the video how does she know that all these threads are connected? So when you wash away the the, the dissolvable fabric that it's going to hold together, that had to have been, must have been many a time when it just came all apart. Yeah, there have been times when I've washed things and thought, oh, how am I going to get this back together again? <laughs> but actually, you can dry it and then you can sandwich it again between two layers of dissolvable fabric so everything is recoverable mm -hmm. because even if you end up with a with a mess you can still sort of cut it or, or work out how to just keep working on it so so I, I I never feel like I've had a a failed attempt at something because something can always be reused you know I I, I make I quite often sit here in an evening and sew a load of um, roots and dirt you know, and I think, oh, how many other people are sewing dirt tonight? I might be the only one. Um, I think you are, yes. <laughs> but but that but but that's the sort of that's quite relaxing process because there's no, you know, I could just sew in any direction because I know that that when I wash it away, it's going to look a real mess. But that doesn't matter because that's what dirt and humus and all the things that are in the soil. That's basically what it is. So. Um, so it kind of works. I can, I can, I can work it out usually. And that, you know, and I've now got to the stage where I, I don't make, well, I've, I don't really feel like I've ever made a mistake. I've just learned along the way. Yeah. Yeah. The other part that impressed me is I think most people would make the cap, but you worry yeah. about the underside too. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's important for support as much as, you know, uh, realism. Um, and actually, you know, if you if you really start studying them, the the underneath are either um, they're quite different. They're not all gills underneath each each mushroom. Some have gills, others have pores with spines, and others just have pores. And they when you look at the underside of those, they they look like honeycomb underneath mm -hmm. and and that's a sort of another interesting sewing technique trying to, to trying to make you know minute 
honeycomb but actually making those give you a really good solid well piece that you're I'm sort of recreating another my own fabric I suppose by by layering and layering um embroidery stitches so yeah so it, it, it's an extra bit of support yeah. mm-hmm. for the for the finished piece now are we using a uh, standard sewing thread or a mixture of threads what are you using for for that well um i use all sorts i love working with silk because i can use the very fine re- the finest silk that i can find um and especially for making some of the lichens that gives beautiful detail so uh, quite often with um free machine embroidery i think a lot of embroiderers like to use quite a heavy weight um thread mm-hmm. because you can get further quicker mm-hmm. whereas i quite like to use the finest threads which obviously take a lot longer but give you better detail um but i would use um so on my extensive uh thread rack i use um superior threads which i love um and they are a combination i use the masterpiece ones because i love the colors and the nature color ones um but they are either rayon uh polyester cotton or silk so and i like to mix it up sometimes in in the bobbin case i would have a rayon thread and then in the top i might put a a silk or a cotton just just because it it just gives it a slightly different dimension Mm -hmm. um and especially if I'm using two different colours, I uh, that that helps. Um, it just makes it look less flat. I think if you're trying to make something that's three dimensional, right. um, if if you've got if you've got different colours, then uh, then I don't know. It just makes it look. It just makes I feel it makes it look less flat. Yeah, and then then yeah, you have you must have have to spend a good deal of time just the subtlety of colour. Uh, throughout these pieces yes so i i yeah i spend ages um, (laughs) looking at and buying threads and and i would say i've probably got about 400 different ones and that's still not enough i still am looking for the ultimate color sometimes but also when you're mixing two different colors together um by the time you've washed that out you've got a new color really so uh yeah i try i suppose it's a bit like mixing paint yes I, i'm using it in the same way yeah yeah i can see that so then you get this worked out and you're able to now start producing these things how do you get noticed i mean do you, do you do an exhibit do you, you just what what are you doing because somebody had to notice you somewhere along the way i would think well, it's it's been a progression. So I I first started do, and I did a couple of trade fairs um, in the north of England, and from that I had a, a few galleries that I then supplied to, and I also did some contemporary craft fairs um, and sort just to gauge reaction and see, you know, who, who was interested in what and and the price points that I could sell at. Um, And it's always a good feeling if you know that you've taken 40 pieces to a show and almost sold them all. Yes. You know, you kind of know that, okay, was that, did I sell those too cheap or was that the right price point for that, for that particular thing? Or, you know, can I edge my prices up a bit more? So um, I suppose I've, I spent three the first three years trying to find the right market and also feeling that you know I'm I'm having been a commercial uh, printed textile designer um, I had to learn about you know whether this doing this is this profitable is there right. is it, it'll always be a hobby if you can't make money doing it uh, and for me it was very much a lifestyle choice but a career hopefully um as much as 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 just a a hobby and there's absolutely nothing wrong with anything ever being a hobby unless you unless you want to make money out of it and 
it's quite difficult in a contemporary craft world to make that jump from, you know, am I just doing this part time and it's earning me a bit of extra pin money or am I doing this seriously to earn money but still enjoy it? Um, That's the, the, the nexus right there. Because so yeah. many people have, have ruined their hobbies trying to make money out of it. And, yeah. And finding that, that happy medium, that's tough. But I think sometimes that happens because you then feel like you've got to go into mass production. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, okay, no mass production. I'm not taking on a team. I'm not – because that's not what I'm doing. That's not what it's about. It's about – it's about my work and it's about how I feel about making something. So therefore I'd, I don't, I don't need it to go into mass production because I don't need to make that much of it to make enough money. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't, you know, I, I've been strict and honest with myself about how much money I want to earn making it making these pieces yeah. so so you've been you you've been able to keep the art part yeah. as the dominant co co facet then yeah. yeah yeah because it's too easy to mass produce something and sell it for not enough money and unfortunately <laughs> quite often with with craft and contemporary craft that's what happens and and it's and it's not fair because <laughs> something might have taken you three hours to make and you're only charging you know twenty dollars or fifteen fifteen pounds for it well that's that's a ridiculous amount of money you can never you yeah. can never make it you'd have to make a lot of those right. per hour to make that work and that was never what it was about so i've always i've always made sure that everything that i that i make is it, you know is what i should be charged for yeah. For, it was what I'm charging right. for it. And I think quite often people, if they, you know, I hope that I'm bringing a skill and, and making a piece of work that, that is, is valued, you know, as a, as a contemporary piece of art or craft. Um, and I kind of feel like I wavered between, between both. And I, you know, it sounds I always feel like it sounds really pompous to say, oh, I'm an artist. I, I, I almost sort of like, oh, it makes me not feel that comfortable. I just think, well, maybe I'm just a contemporary crafts person. No, no, it's it's art. See, that's the and, and that's the thing. Of course, we deal with that in, in needlework of any kind is that that old question. Is it craft? Is it hobby? Is it art? And, yeah. you know, at what point does it become art? And that was what stood out for me with your work is it to me, it's just pure art, uh, absolute art because uh, of how you're going about it. And yeah, you're, you're imitating as close as you can, uh, nature, but to accomplish that takes art, takes skill. Uh, there's, there's just so many dimensions to it that, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's no question that it's absolutely art and, and something to be proud of. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. You know, I I, I think um, any needle craft just still gets a bad press. Yes. And it is such a shame that, um, you know, a once revered um, craft that was, you know, very well paid has fallen <laughs> into uh, the state that, that it is in. A little bit now and I, I kind of hope that what I'm doing will sort of redress that balance a little bit and say you know actually embroidery is an incredible art um, and, and you know and skill although I'm not trained as an embroiderer um, <clears throat> but there are so many incredible embroiderers out there yes. who, who, who do fantastic work and I just hope that they are recognized for their for their skill um and, and i suppose my you know going back to what we were saying earlier my, my the business head on me says in order to make this work um you have to be businesslike about it and um and sometimes that's hard when you're a creative person to be able to to yeah. recognize that right oh yeah very very hard because yeah it's mm. it's you're not making it thinking how many dollars can i get out of this 
uh, you're you're making it because you you want to create something and uh, yeah, I, yeah. Had, I was, I was doing I doing needlepoint on an international flight uh, one time a couple of years ago and one of the flight attendants came up and said oh do you sell those and I said <laughs> no because you couldn't afford it <laughs> no it's true you know, the hours are it's true in, because you know. someone yeah somebody's not going to be especially with quilting there is there's so many hours worth of work in 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 quilting and needlepoint and i you know you're right people people never w would want to pay no. for the hours that had gone into the amount of work that it takes and i i still work long hours you know i'm not i'm not i'm certainly not knocking them out at, at speed it's not how it works yeah. however i i have managed over the last five years to build up a, a reputation enough to to still do an honest day's work and not i'm not i'm not a millionaire however <laughs> um i'm i'm still feel that i'm getting the, the what i can what i can make yeah. charge for the work is is sort of justifying what it is yeah um and, and actually, having last year, um, having done Chelsea Flower Show, do you, have you heard? Do you know Chelsea? Do you know, I've heard, heard of it. Chelsea yes. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like the world's biggest, or supposedly the world's biggest, um, you know, flower and garden event. And uh, I had a stand there, and I suppose that sort of suddenly, sort of skyrocketed me to <laughs> everybody wanting a piece of work. Um, and you know, I've only recently from from the show last May, um, I had to cap all my commissions because I just couldn't take on the amount of you know I'd sold all the work and then couldn't take on all the commissions. <laughs> so, which is great for me, but not so great for anybody else that's now waiting. Right. Um, but but I am only me, and I can only make so much, and I'm only prepared to make so much per year because. I don't want it to be a production line. And, and I suppose that was my point earlier that I, I want it to be a little bit exclusive um, because it keeps it precious and you don't want to lose sight of what it is that you're doing. Right. Well, and you, and at some point you have to guard against burnout too. I mean, you could just completely yeah. just suck the life out of it. Trying to, yeah. trying to make as many as possible to satisfy everyone. Yeah. And I've done that. I've done that in the past and <laughs> learned by those mistakes of that's that it, it can't work like that yeah. because it, it would just be hell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And you, you mentioned commissions and that was two other areas I wanted to look at was, and, and I guess you pretty much answered that question because you have, it's such unique art and what, the way you display it in those acrylic boxes is just so visually beautiful uh, oh, that you. I would I would think that you would get calls for commission, but then I also wonder is there is there an element that is of interest to the scientific community or how, has that come up? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I've had um, uh, yeah, having exhibited at Chelsea Flower Show and at um, the RHS. Um, I think it's their headquarters in London um, and at Q that um, it it brings it brings out the the curious scientists as well and I and I kind of that that's sort of really thrilling when um, y you meet specialists who <laughs> are yes. really loving it and in fact um, I did a little trip to New York in uh, November last year and. Um, I put something on Instagram saying, you know, I'm doing a flying visit. Anyone can anyone recommend uh, some places that I might be able to, you know, go and have a look at? And um, there was there's a girl that um, I that we we follow each other on Instagram, and she said, oh, um, sh she works in the herbarium at um, the New York uh, Botanical Gardens, and said, you know, if you've got time, come and have a look. And that was such a huge honour and a pleasure to go and to go and meet everyone at the botanical gardens. Uh, it's very similar to Kew, but it's sort of you get to see behind the scenes there, and to hear them talk about the work and the fact, you know, the things that they love about the work, and they know they kind of know what they're looking for, mm -hmm. um, and for, 
for them to be impressed is a huge honor <laughs> that they think that it's good enough that I've that that I've um you know impressed them um so it's, it's everybody, the people, you know, there are people that, that buy the work just because they, they like the way it's displayed and, and, and the subject. And there are other people who are enthusiasts and mushroom enthusiasts or, you know, um, there was an, another lady, uh, one of my customers is the head of bryology at um, uh, Edinburgh Botanical Gardens. And biology is a, a study of um, liverworts and uh, lichen. And um, she, she commissioned me to make a piece for her, which I made. And um, she very kindly sent me an email um, saying that she'd shown everyone in her department and they were, they were, you know, really excited to see it. And um, they thought it was that it was you know, the right thing. I've yeah. done the right thing. So, and that, and that to me is that I've job done. I've, I've done what I set out to do. I have made something that someone can say, yes, you've, you've made a good representation of, of that species. And, yeah. and that's, 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 you know, incredible. And I, I'm, you know, going forward in the future, I hope that I will, um, I will do more of that. I did have um, someone from the Mycology Society saying, you know, would I would I do an exhibition or would I could I show some of my work there? So so all these things are, are sort of, you know, in the pipeline, as it were. Well, that's got to be incredibly gratifying. People who know exactly what's right and what isn't, who then look at your work and say, yes, yes, you, you, you hit it. That's uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's always that slight nervous moment when you know who <laughs> yeah, they are. And you think, oh God, are you gonna, <laughs> are you gonna tell me it's wrong? Yeah, yeah. How could you possibly do the gills that way? They aren't anything like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I had, um, I've got this reference book, um, which is written by Roger Phillips, who's, a, um, a, you know, he's written what could be described as uh, one of the most comprehensive guides to um, mushrooms and other fungi. And um, I, we, we're now Instagram friends um, because he came and he met me at one of the shows that I was doing. Uh, well, he well, he didn't introduce himself, actually. He said he was interested and then looked at the work and said, oh, yes, you know, yes, these are very good. And and then he said, oh, I've, oh, I've written a book on mushrooms. And I said, oh, Oh, I might, I might know it. What's your name? And he said, Oh, it's Roger Phillips. And I sort of like almost fell over. I was like, Oh, that's my best book. <laughs> I'm almost sad that I didn't have it there for him to sign for me. But, but he, he, he sort of said, Yes, you, you, you're doing, you're doing well. You're doing the right thing. These are good representations. And I think, Well, if it's good enough for Roger Phillips, then it must be all right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There you have it, right there. Well, Amanda. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is uh, this has been a treat to talk to you. Appreciate the time. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Yep. And uh, for folks who are listening, uh, I'll put some pictures on the uh, website page for this podcast, but also a link to Amanda's site. And there she has a full gallery of her work. And uh, she'll owe you a couple hours. I'll tell you, you'll sit there just gaping at it. I guarantee you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's beautiful work all the way around. It really is. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thanks to Sassy Jacks. Thank you, Jacks. Gary.